Hey guys, Joe Saunders here. Just want to take a couple of minutes to talk to you about the aggression cycle. So the aggression cycle is essentially a model that helps us understand uh, and diagnose what stage of aggression somebody is at before we start trying to, uh, to verbally de-escalate. And each stage of the aggression cycle has different strategies that are appropriate. So at the very beginning of the aggression cycle, someone starts with baseline behavior. So whatever is normal for them uh, in, in their particular state of mind, in their particular frame of uh, reference, in their way of life, what is normal behavior for them? That's baseline. At some point, they will be triggered by an event. No one really gets angry for no reason. There's always a trigger. It's not always a rational trigger. It's not always a logical thing. It's not always a reasonable thing, but there's always something. It's sometimes it's a sudden acute moment. Sometimes it's a buildup that's the uh, proverbial straw that broke the camel's back. Something very minor triggers uh, disproportionate aggression and, uh, and outrage, uh, but that's due to uh, a buildup that's happened over time. So the triggering event it's very important for us to understand what in our environment may trigger somebody, especially if we're talking about a workplace context, if we're talking about a customer service environment, understanding what the triggers are in our environment so that we can preempt and we can get in early and either remove the triggers or at least be understanding of the fact that this particular scenario will sometimes trigger somebody. So we need to be very alert and very aware and monitor the behavior of people that are in front of us so we can determine if they've been triggered. Once they've been triggered, they will start to escalate. The escalation phase uh, can be very long and drawn out, or it can take hours, or it can be very sudden. It can take literally split second, uh, and the person will be escalated from the trigger to the crisis point. Most of the time, it's somewhere in between. It's a, it's a, it's a process that you can observe, changes in behavior uh, that will indicate that someone is escalating towards a crisis point. The earlier we can identify this escalation phase, the more options we have and the better success we'll have at being able to verbally de-escalate the, uh, the behavior. So that's why it's so important for us to understand uh, the triggers, because the earlier we pick up on the trigger, the earlier we'll be able to recognize the signs of escalation and start to de-escalate. Once the person has escalated past about halfway point on that, uh, that aggression cycle, it is very, very difficult to de-escalate them again. Uh, it's like a car rolling downhill. If you stop it uh, just as it starts to move, you're good. If you try and stop it once it's already going at 30 k's an hour, you're gonna get run over. So you need to make sure that you are putting measures in place to de-escalate as soon as humanly possible. As soon as you're aware, start de-escalating. If it's already gone too far, there's no point anymore. You're just putting yourself at risk. So signs of escalating behavior are things like tense, uh, tense movement, like fist clench, jaw clench like this, talking through their teeth, sighing, <sighs> muttering. Um, it might be puffing themselves out. It might, it might be sort of a bit of a bit of shiftiness. It might be being jittery, okay? Uh, there's a whole bunch of things. I'll cover in another video, different signs of escalation. But the important thing is that you understand that people will exhibit signs of escalation in their behavior. The sooner you recognize those, the sooner you can put measures in place to try and uh, address them, the better success you will have a verbal de-escalation. Once a person has moved past the escalation phase into crisis point, at that, part, at that point, de-escalation is no longer available to us. They are emotionally dominant, not cognitively dominant. Sorry, emotionally, not cognitively dominant, which means that any rational, reasonable um, approach that you take of trying to problem solve is gonna fail. They're not gonna be interested in it. They are purely emotionally dominant at this point. And essentially, unless you are highly skilled at controlling emotion and you're highly skilled at crisis management and crisis intervention, there is no point you being there at that point. The only option is to get yourself safe or to physically intervene for most people. Uh, if that's the case and you're in a workplace, get yourself safe. Hit your duress buttons, activate your security plan, get police or security or whoever it is that's gonna respond, get them to come to you, uh, but your priority now is safety. The escalation phase is uh, the part where you can do your good. Uh, once it gets towards the crisis point, uh, really your options are very limited and your priority has to be safety. The crisis point will only last for a set amount of time and then the person will start to de-escalate. If you are still involved at this point during the de-escalation phase, your priority is just to facilitate the de-escalation. So whatever it is that's bringing that person down, facilitate that. Remove the trigger, whatever it was that, that triggered them down here, 
remove that. If it's a person, even if it's you, get out of there. The trigger needs to be moved away. They need to be taken away from whatever upset them because during this de-escalation phase, they are very likely to be re-triggered again. So we need to be very aware of that. Uh, it's not the time for conversation about their behavior or, or, or reprimanding them or punishing them or anything like that. That's not the time. We can't do that during the de-escalation phase or it will re-escalate them and then we're back to crisis point, back in danger again. De-escalation phase is about maintaining the safety for everybody and facilitating de-escalation of the subject. For most people, that's the end of your involvement. By that point, either the person will have left, the police will be there, security will be taking, taking control. However, if you are in an ongoing care environment, like let's say you're working in a shelter or you're working in uh, healthcare, uh, or you're working in the, the prison system, corrections, law enforcement, whatever, where you will have ongoing contact with somebody after that de-escalation phase. It's also very important to understand that they'll often go into a post-crisis depression. So in the post-crisis depression, their behavior will dip. Uh, they might be very reserved, they might be remorseful, they might be sad. Uh, it can be unusually low behavior for that individual. That takes time to pass, sometimes even a couple of days for that to pass, and then eventually they'll return back to normal. If we're talking about beha long-term behavioral management, client relationships, uh, patient relationships, after that dip is the time that you can start to have conversations about moving forward after that incident. But there's no point doing a counseling or doing a, a, an action plan until that whole cycle has been completed and they're back to normal. Once they're back to normal, now we can have rational conversations. But we need to debrief and make sure that we've learned the triggers so that the next time we see this person, the next time we have this situation, that we do not repeat the same triggers because that would be silly. I hope this has helped. If you have any questions or comments or you have any experiences that validate this or contradict this, please, by all means, throw them in the comments below. We'd love to talk to you. And of course, if you want any more information, check out my website, www.josaunders.com.au and the podcast, The Managing Violence Podcast on all major podcast providers. Uh, it would be great to reach out, it'd be great to talk to you. I am available for consulting, training, speaking, anything that you want, I pretty much can do it. Uh, if you're in at all interested in violence prevention and aggression management, I'd love to hear from you.